Okay, so today's guest is going to be Richard Jensen. Richard is from Oregon, from Portland, Oregon. Actually, what high school did you go to uh, in the Portland? Tigard High School back in 1989, graduate 89. So Tigard, class 89, huh? The Tiger, the Tiger Tigers, yep. Okay, is Troy Palamalu from Tigard or Scapoose? I forget. He's from one of them. I forget which one. It's not Tigard, you'd know. Yeah, I know. What year? Tigard's right there. It's like, yeah. it's west. Oh, yeah. Southwest? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Scapoos is half hour away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So, I got married in Portland, Oregon. But just to introduce Richard for the, the Barbarian Hour, Richard is a uh, champion in life. Um, his book is called Be a Champion in Life. And Richard has uh, a tour coming up. New Hope Tour is the name of the new tour that you're going to be on, Richard? The Be a Champion Life Hope Tour. That's right. Okay. Tell me about the tour and where does it start? Does it start in Portland and end in Portland? Or where? What, what's the what's the gist of the tour? And, you know, we want to get into people what, what your story is. And yep. uh, you are a national qualifier for the junior college at 36 years old. 38. For, you were 38 yep. Yep. years old and you qualified <laughs> for the junior college national tournament for Clackamas Community College uh, over in just – uh, east of Portland, and that's not Oregon City, is it? Uh, it's Clackamas. Yeah, it's, Cla- it's, it's Clackamas. It's its own. Okay, yep. it's Clackamas. Okay, but it's a it's a suburb of Portland, Oregon. Yep, yep, in Oregon City. Yep, it's yep. all in the same little demographic. That's right. Um, so City, yeah, it's Oregon City yep. off of ninety nine E. It is. Yep. Okay. Yep, okay. Yep, got it. Okay. Yep, so yep. tell, give everybody the gist of the story why a thirty eight year old man goes on to a junior college wrestling team which is now the powerhouse. They won the last four junior college right, games. Right, right. Alum, <laughs> right. Qualified there. Coach Roden did a great job. Now he's at Oregon State. Um, but why was a 38-year-old man on the team with a 24-year-old head coach? Yeah. That's what he said. Right. Road Dog told me. He's like, I was 24 <laughs> coaching this old guy. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. He was 24. I was 38. The athletes were 18, 19. Uh, you know, it's a really unique uh, – unique story unique scenario uh but uh first you gotta you gotta understand like wrestling was was the heartbeat growing up like for me like you know uh, going through middle school high school wrestling was was the the recipe you know that was the thing that helped keep me grounded helped uh keep me engaged um gave me a self a sense of identity you know i was a wrestler um and so uh you know, I wasn't a um, a real successful high school wrestler, you know, at the top of the podium. But wrestling was that that key that 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 key element that I needed. Um, I was in heaven, man, when I found wrestling. Part of the team, uh, the camaraderie, um, the uh, setting goals and chasing accomplishments and goals and. You know, um, I found family through wrestling. I found that that community that um, that I was looking for. You know, um, I was a um, real hyper kid. I was I was in trouble. Um, had trouble navigating through. You know, having trouble navigating as a kid. And once I found wrestling, man, it was like, oh boy, this is magic for me. You know, and um, you know. Uh, and truth is wrestling ended up saving my life later on down the road because I was exposed to the sport because I had that sport in my life, you know, when I was young. So, uh, 38 years old. Yeah. <laughs> so how you know? long at that point? So I watched the ESPN special that they did on you. And yeah. first off, it was excellent. Um, I believe it won an Emmy award. It did. That, that that's incredible. I mean, and that's your life. The content of your life won an Emmy award. I think that's an, an amazing accomplishment, but you know, I'm watching it and you know, your nickname was red. The nickname was red, right? Like everyone who's kept calling you yeah. red. Every, every, yeah. I was, maybe your sister was calling you red. Um, but you know, cause you wrestled hard. Like you said, you weren't great, but you wrestled hard. Right. And yeah, the one the one thing I had was a lot of heart, man. I would drive the team. I was the inspiration that drove the team's intensity and positivity. And I may not have won a lot of matches with the Big W, but I fought hard through all the matches, and it drove the 
it inspired and drove the team, you know? So it was that heart. It was that element that I had, that little extra piece, you know, that really helped bring the team together and, and explode. When <laughs> I was called red. So if you know me over the 30 years, you call me red. So I grew up, that was the only name I knew going through middle school, high school. That was the, the nickname and it carried on. I had this big mop of red curly hair, just this big mop of hair, man. And they called me red forever. And still there's, people today that still call me red you know but your story is a story of it's about addiction and it's about being near death coming out of prison it's a it's the truest story of redemption i think i've ever seen in the sport of wrestling if there you know if there's one that i'm gonna put in the top three your story is a, a story of redemption that you could have succumbed to drug and alcohol abuse you did not you went and you found a junior college team and you, you, you qualified for the national tournament. That was pretty sweet. <laughs> Eight years old. And it, the story is just, it's truly inspiring. And, and that's what you do for a living now. You inspire people who've been in the depths of, of, of addiction, right? That, that is what your story is about. Or, or kids whose parents are in the depths of addiction. That's what the hope is about, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, talking about the national hope tour, you know, we've been traveling for years now. Um, but it's about inspiring kids and teaching kids about some of the dangers of poor choices, di addiction, encouraging leadership, instilling a little hope in parents and loved ones that see addiction around in their family, you know, and, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta realize like, like, you know, and, 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 and let me give you a snapshot of the story, Zeb. I mean, they, they, they gotta know what happened, you know? I get in depth with my autobiography and I talk about it. I'm very intimate. I'm very vulnerable. I'm very honest with, with where I was at, you know, um, and, and wrestling becoming that key element that nobody, very few thought it, 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 it could be done. Very few thought it could be done at 38, you know, so, so, but they didn't realize I was trying to save my life. It was much bigger than wrestling. It was so much bigger than wrestling, you know. I'm a kid that hasn't done drugs or drank through high school. Got off, graduated from high school, had no wrestling, had no high school, had no accountability to my parents, and went off fishing in Alaska. Yeah. And once I got up there, I was exposed to a, a tough lifestyle, you know, and addiction and, and, and alcoholism. And, and, man, I found, you know, and to be honest, I found my best friend. That's what happened over time. I found my best friend. I was able, to, you know, I lived in that world for almost 20 years. Um, and it was destroying my life, mind you. But, um, you know, that false sense of confidence, that false sense of, of, of identity and, and that, that false community, um, um, you know, I was addicted to drugs as soon as I tried it. Was, you know? was drugs your best friend? Is that what you're alluding to? Was, yeah, was, yeah. Was drugs I mean, was your best I, friend? Yeah, once I used drugs, I was addicted immediately, and it became the driving force. Like, I couldn't do anything without using drugs, or I thought I couldn't do anything without using drugs. And, um, you know, what I found is over time, it slowly started chipping away at my life, you know, my, 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 my identity, my character, my boundaries started getting adjusted and I did things that I never thought I'd ever do Zeb you know um and it became my whole world um and uh you know it's a it's it's a monster man and so um addiction and alcoholism is a monster and it destroys that's its goal is to destroy families and destroy you you know and um so I was fortunate enough you know to get through that to the other side but that hopeless feeling that I had for so many years um i'd wish upon nobody you know um and you look at 15 plus years of my life is is gone and destroyed and um i spent some time in prison and jail and living in a homeless shelter zeb like so my bottom was very low my bottom was was very very low um and uh I thank God every single day that I was able to find wrestling at 38 when nobody thought that you could even be part of the team, you know, because I don't know what it would look like any other, any other way. I don't know exactly how it would have worked out, but I know that wrestling became that, that key recipe, man, just to be able to step back in that room, 
because I know that when I was coming out of that homeless shelter and I was trying to get sober, I looked back on my life at some of the positive role models, the positive people that were in my life when I was growing up. And the one thing I kept thinking about was that coach, H.D. Waddell, back in high school. You know, and uh, and uh, the values that he instilled in me as a kid, you know, I knew that I wanted that environment back in my life. I wanted that back in my life. And I didn't know if I could have it, you know. Um, Rich, I guess my questions are, what's the fork in the road? The fork in the road sounds like it's, you go up to Alaska and just to give people context. So I was married in Portland, Oregon, and my best friend moved there in 2003. So I'm very familiar with the Pacific Northwest. I get out there a lot, right? And it's a different place. The Pacific Northwest is a different place. I've actually traveled up to Alaska, to Anchorage, to Fairbanks, to Denali. I've done all that. So I know these areas you're talking about. It's really hard for people who are Midwesterners because, you know, it's, it's real plain terrain around here you guys got big mountains you got the ocean you got the columbia river gorge you got the deschutes river the illinois river the north umqua you've got all these different beautiful rivers you got all these just unbelievable mountains in washington and oregon you got the sisters i mean it's just every you got the coastal range you got the you got the uh cascades it's 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 a wild place where you're at and i don't think people get that so it's a different place in the society that like just how people are is very different out there. Yeah. You actually I'm a drug addict. I'm not saying everybody's a hippie, but yeah, it is yeah. not like the same. You are not getting the same people in the Pacific Northwest that you are getting in the Midwest. It's just, it's, it's a different place. And I don't think a lot of people get that. And Absolutely. You're pretty versed in Oregon. That was good. That was actually really good. You, you know about, yeah. About I was, I married my wife out the there. I, I, yeah, got yeah, married yeah. At, I told you I got married at Tryon <laughs> state park yeah, and then, yeah. And then my best friend lived across the street from you, right by Westmoreland Park. Oh, yeah. Uh, right by the Selwood, Selwood neighborhood. Yeah. Um, his cross street was like Tolman and Southeast 23rd, I want to say. I could probably hit a golf ball. Well, maybe not me, but Mike Krause can hit a golf ball. Over. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but you get my point. Like, I know Oregon, man. Yeah. I know it's the Rose City. It's, you know, Stump Town. They got a bunch of different nicknames, right? Oh, yeah. And it is just – and it's changed a lot, you know, obviously in the last um, three to five years, it's really changed. Yeah. And, and, and Portland's gone through multiple revolutions, right? San Francisco has gone through multiple revolutions, Seattle, West coast cities, Los Angeles, all these cities, West coast is different. And I don't know if people really get that about the Pacific Northwest. You're also the first part of the country that was hit by the meth epidemic that hit the United right. States of America, right? Which kind of yep. caught you up in that and then the other yep. thing is i'm also versed in what the oregonian did with the faces of meth and multnomah county yep. Yep. and um i don't know i don't i don't know this but did you ever appear in any of the any of the faces of meth uh, i did not that was after my time i've been clean almost 20 years okay job, so you know that was, was like oh five oh three oh yeah. four oh yep. five when the yep. oregonian was really hot hot on yep. the, the meth trail put right your face right on the front page yep. you know yeah and, and so, so I just like, so just to give people an idea, it's a different place out in the Pacific Northwest. People are different. There's a lot more to do outdoors, yep. right? There's mountains to climb, there's oceans, there's rivers, there's all these crazy, amazing, beautiful things. And with that, you get a different crowd of people. <laughs> yeah. I was <laughs> raised a different crowd. I was raised hunting and camping and two hours to the West. I'm at the beach two hours to the East. I'm on Mount hood, you know, skiing yeah. and hiking. And, um, it's a beautiful part of the country. That's for sure. You know, it's one of the most beautiful parts of the whole country is the Pacific Northwest, you know? Um, but we've got, you know, and, and unfortunately, um, it's become a massive homeless gather, you know, it's the community has gotten, uh, um, a lot of homeless over the years, you know. Also, you know, the, the Oregon is 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 legalizing marijuana. It's legalizing drugs. It's they're you know so it's you know and 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 basically I'm out trying to fight that a little bit by talking to the kids. I'm trying to get them to understand like it might be legal, it might be okay, but it doesn't mean it's going to work out for a positive in your life. You know, 
Um, and whether it was legal or not, man, once I used recreational drugs, I was a monster, man. My life, I was a monster. Rich, I became a different start? person. Where did you start? Where did it start? Like, yeah. where did it start well, on so, the fishing boat? In, in so it started, it started with drinking, you know, and then pretty soon I, I realized that I have a problem stopping i don't have an on off switch like some people i could i would drink and just keep drinking and what i found is is that i i didn't have that control that some have you know and then um you know shortly in a short period of time i wanted to experiment with meth you know and as you know if you if you google my name and research my story you i'm very open and transparent about everything you know and i think that's helped me with the healing process, really, you know, being accountable and, you know, um, uh, recognizing the, you know, the things that I had done and figuring out what makes me tick, you know, and I have deep alcoholism in my dad's side of the family, you know, um, not a lot of drugs, but when I used drugs, I just didn't know, I couldn't stop, I couldn't control it, you know, um, and, uh, you know, meth is, it was big, is big out here, it was big out here, you know, um, and, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the thing is, man, um, is that once I got sober, you know, first off, let's talk about the why in the road. Let's talk about this because people always ask me what the magic recipe is, right? They want to know the magic answer, you know, and today we look on the news, we look on TV and everybody has a pill for everything. We can fix your life. We can, you can lose weight. You can feel better about yourself. And, um, you know, for me, um, you know, getting sober, I had to hit a pretty low bottom, unfortunately. And I talk about it in my book. There's uh, a few things that had to happen at the right time within a short period of time. So that, and for me, it was going to maximum state prison finally, you know, graduating, you know, being confined in a prison cell. I lost my mom, the rock, the you know, the most important role model in my life. And, um, and then I was paroled to a homeless shelter with the clothes on my back. And so, you know, at that point in time, I had a choice to make, you know, and that choice was um, to do whatever it took to change my life and figure out how to, how to live a more positive life. Um, and uh, it wasn't easy. You know, it's hard. It's, you're not just getting sober. You're not just getting off the drugs. Yeah? You're, you've got to learn how to navigate life. It's bigger than that. You know, you take the drugs out, you still got a whole lot of life to figure out, you know? And, um, I had abandoned my kids. I had, you know, um, uh, hurt my family. I had, uh, put myself in debt and all these things, um, that needed to heal. and you know, there was a lot of work ahead. Um, how old but, are your kids? How many kids do you have and how old are you? Uh, I have two kids. They're grown now. I have grandkids, you know. Uh, but one of my oldest daughter was around 15 when I got sober. And my youngest daughter was about 10, you know. She was uh, six right in there. I've been sober a long time. So, so, so hold on. Have you been able to repair your relationships with them? Do you have um, relationships with your grandchildren? So, yes, yes, yes. It was the most important thing I could possibly do was become a father and be accountable and make sure that my kids knew they could count on me. I had, you know, and, and this is a great story because you get sober, you think your life's going to change overnight. You think you're going to get your car back, your wife, your family, your house. And what you realize is that you've got to step back and trust in the process and know that I spent almost 20 years messing my life up, Zeb. It's going to take some time to rebuild my life. And I think that was the most important thing that I could have recognized and realized was that this wasn't going to happen overnight, you know. And I need to be patient with the process. And what I'm going to tell you is that my kids were the – so my number one goal at the top, far and before becoming a wrestler again, okay, was to try to figure out how to, how to repair the relationship with my kids. I knew that if I could do that, whatever that process took, if I could do that, then everything else in my life would be better, right? Because all the things I'd have to do to do that, the rest of my life would get better. And uh, I'll tell you what, the hardest thing was 
getting getting back into my kids' lives and understanding another it was understanding that they have to go through their process now. They have a right to be mad at me. They got a right to be disappointed. They get to take all the time they need before they feel safe and comfortable, you know, to accept me in, right? And my kids called me Rick for two years. And it was and it was heart wrenching, Zeb, you know. I'd go see my kids and they called me Rick, you know. And uh, what I'm gonna tell you is they had a right to do that. It took about two years before they started calling me dad, you know. Think think about this though, and uh, having empathy for your kids, which you had to have. You were a monster essentially to them. You were a monster to them because yep. what the, the drugs made you a monster. I mean, yep. I looked, I've looked at a lot of different research on what, uh, what meth does to the brain. And the, the, the dopamine spike that meth provides is found nowhere else in nature. I can't jump off a skyscraper. We got this Johnny DeJulius kid. Uh, he wrestled for Ohio State. Yep. And he's, a, he's an adrenaline junkie, right? And, he's, yep. and he, he's jumped off. There's a windmill at the school where he was doing a clinic yesterday where my kids go, there's a, my kid's like, dad, that, that windmill is not high enough for him to jump off of the parachute. My wife's like, how did he jump? He jumped off the windmill, like a 200 foot windmill over here. <laughs> I mean, but, but there's, so I want you to think about that. Yeah. There's nothing in nature jumping off a windmill with a, a parachute on your back and landing in the football field. There's nothing in nature that provides the dopamine spike or the adrenaline spike that, something like meth does not not it's, naturally occurring so right are taking they're taking a hit of meth and they can stay up for five and six days right right yep. and then you see them and then that faces of meth the big thing with that was how people aged in three to five years they'd age look looking in their internal organs because you need we need sleep and it deprives you of that it would age you 20 years in in three years right yep. which is amazing that you look your age yeah for all yeah. the years of addiction that, you know, where you abused and, and then, to, well, yeah, tell me more about your kids. They're so, so there's such a high, high, there's that, that low, low on the backside. So that's what, that's the, you, it's such an uncomfortable low on the backside. That's what drives us to use again, you know, and that's one of the, one of the things that keeps, keeps users using. Um, and uh, I always say, Hey, cause I, you know, here's the thing, you know, they go, well, I had a kid come up to me one time at a seminar and he goes, you 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 didn't use drugs like you said you did i you know I, i've seen i've seen it in my family right because they're all messed up from it right yeah. and i said well son, i use drugs exactly like i said if not worse than what i said but what i'm going to tell you is that i was locked up seven years out of that 15 and it kept me kind of preserved and then i when i did get sober i became an elite athlete and i trained and worked on my health and fitness and i lived this thing as as I did not miss a beat because I knew I needed all the edge and it helped keep my youth. And it, it really, really um, took care of me. You know, it helped my skin. It helped my everything, you know, my mental welfare, my physical uh, uh, strength, my spiritual fitness, everything. I trained for 10 years. You know, I went back to college for those two years, but then I went and competed with the masters for another nine, you know? So 10 years of my adult life, I trained like an elite athlete, you know? And with that comes health, you know, and, and this, you know, <laughs> what is, what would you say is, um, obviously you talk about the lowest low, losing your mom's the lowest low, I think, because that was, she was your role model, but the lowest low, when you're sitting in a prison cell and you're, you're detoxing essentially because, but uh, you know, people, there's different perception of what prison and penitentiary are like, right? Because Someone like me, I'm a teacher. I, I have, I'd have never lived in that world. I don't ever intend to live in that world. But what is, is that where you meet, is that where bottom, you meet the bottom when you're locked up in a, in a, in a little room like what I'm in right now? When is bottom and then when you're trying to detox from drugs and you're in this area where there's all these different codes and gangs and you join a gang or don't join a gang? What is the, the whole penitentiary and prison experience like when you're trying to get off drugs? Well, so, so, so you're, you, you adapt too. There's an adaptation that happens too over time, not just being a drug, but a convict, a, you know, a, a prisoner. And uh, I actually had that prison mentality. I'd been locked up in jail so many times and in prison and that convict 
belief system, you know, and then it just became kind of the norm to be going in and out of jail on a regular basis. But I think when I, when I really, but the, the, when I really started realizing it was when, when uh, um, a couple of years before I got sober, you know, I realized like I'm at the bottom of the barrel, man, you know, and um, I'm doing more time in jail than I am out drugs are running my life and I have distanced myself from my, the people that I love, my family that love me, you know, my kids. And as I got a little older, I started realizing and recognizing that I'm not just hurting myself. Deb. And once I recognized that, then it was about trying to figure out how to uh, get the help I needed. You know, um, the, the hard part is recognizing that you're you need help and that you want help and that there is help accessible to you um and i remember getting out of jail i did a year in jail i wrote about this in my book i did a year in jail and i got out i was going to stay sober man i was going to stay sober i was going to change my life i wrote my kids while i was in there and i felt like i was a different person coming out and um and i thought i was going to be able to do it on my own and i didn't last very long Zeb. Um, and then, uh, I used again and then I went back in that hole and then I got locked up again shortly after that. And, um, and then I went to prison, you know, I've been in jail for long, off and on, but then I went to prison and that's where I, I write about how I was sitting at the, at the, at the, um, cafeteria table. And I was sitting with a guy that's doing life, another guy that's doing a hundred years. These guys are killers. And I got to thinking, you know, and they're not much, they're 15, 20 years older than me and they made a lifestyle of it. And that's all they ever knew. And I'm like, you know, I don't want that to be me in 20 years, man. I want to figure out how to get out of this. This is, this could be me by one bad mistake on a drunken night, you know, that I'm doing life because something happens to some innocent person, man. And, um, and I got out and I knew that I was going to have to get some professional help. You got to be willing to step out of the way and go, okay, I can't do this by myself, Deb. I need 12 step. I need AA. I need treatment. I need mentorship. I need to trust in that process because it really does work to get around other people that have been through the struggle, that have found success, that are trying to do the right thing. Um, and we can relate to each other. Do we make it too difficult in our society in the United States of America, in the state of Oregon? Because you were in the penitentiary, you were in the federal, you were in the state system, not the federal system. Do we make it too hard for convicts and felons to reacclimate and reassimilate to uh, regular life? Do we make it too difficult on you guys? Yes, most states don't have a continuum of care, an aftercare, a treatment plan. You know, a lot of states don't, um, and unfortunately, there's not enough programs accessible to to us you know um and uh i think that uh you know um like i said i never even knew anything about aa i never knew anything about it never even heard of it until you know 2003 you know i was in prison and, and i caught a glimpse of this thing and so i thought well maybe that's what i need to do is find aa you know <laughs> or na and uh i just wasn't exposed to it uh, but there's not a lot of programs. There's not a lot of aftercare. There's not a lot of reprogramming and mentorship programs. Um, and, uh, you know, they say that, like in Oregon specifically, they say that's what that, the legalizing the, the, the drugs now, um, less people in prison, the funds will go towards programs. And now they're looking at the stats two years later and there, there's no money going into these programs. So, you know, who knows what's, what's real and what's not. But, but I you do guys know decriminalized that, everything. You decriminalized heroin. Everything, you decriminalized everything, meth. Everything. And if it was only a personal use amount, they weren't charging yeah. you with felonies. Is that what, what, what I'm – am I getting that right? Is that the gist that's, of it? That's the gist of it, yes. But what does that mean? You know, the, 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 the personal amounts seem to be so much. You know, it's like you, – you, anyway, I don't – you know – Yes, yes. But that was the yes. gist of what it, the legislation yes, did. Yes, that was it. It's like, you know, trying to thin out the population in prison and give tickets, all this. 
but you know the problem is, is it's failed, Zeb. It's failed. It's not working like they had. Who to thunk it? To work. Who to yeah, thunk yeah. that? Legalized and everything. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's going to work great, guys. It's, it's I, wild. I mean, know. things in theory and then things implemented in practice are obviously very different. It's just like, I mean, I needed to go to jail. Anything. I needed to go to prison, Zeb. I needed to go to prison. I needed to go to jail over and over until I finally got it. I needed to do that for me. I, I don't, you know, it, you know, um, but, you know, let's get it. So, so, so we know that, and, and the last couple of years, we've got mental health issues. We've got drug drug issues we've got some stuff going on in the world right now Jeff. and whether it be the pandemic and and lack of of human connection and you know all and, and and all this stuff going on that's why this hope tour is so important right now you know because i have been shut down i was speaking to upwards of forty thousand kids a year in 18 and 19 and then to go to zero it really pulled the rug out from under me like i was shut down and uh, been at idle for a couple of years. Um, so we're, what do you do? Right? <laughs> yeah. Work out? Go hike? What are you doing? Because you're shut down. You're shut down. Shut down out there. Like we could still do whatever yeah. we wanted. I went and hiked right. with my kids every day. Did whatever I wanted. But my nephew lived in um, Albany, and he was yep. like, "No, things were legit shut down. You couldn't go do anything. The parks were shut down. There were people that would like." kick at you if they caught you on the beach he's because he lived you know what i mean he lived out there he was a coach at oregon state and he was just like yeah you couldn't really do anything they shut us down you know um i remember talking to guy too i was like well what kind of a wrestling season did you guys have right and he's like well, we had a full wrestling season i'm like what this and you guys just operated as you know yeah. like nothing happened and here we are we can't even leave the freaking house you know yep. and it's wild a totally it wild was, stuff. It was tormenting. You know, it was hard on everything. You know, and it's like, I, it was hard on coaches. It was hard on the athletes. It was hard on students, families. But you know what? I'll tell you what. For me, I got to spend a lot of time with my family. I got to really bond with my family. And I got to lighten my plate. I got to take a few things off my plate, slow down and stop and reflect and actually do a lot of self-reflection on wow we've done that the last 10 15 years well let's strategically make some changes and adjustments for what's ahead you know and uh, and, and it, it did hurt though but i have i'm lucky i have a small business to rely on that, that you know that is not my only thing that i have going on i have a small auto shop that helped pay my mortgage you know gotcha. but 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 the be a champion got shut to zero dude <laughs> so how many employees do you have rich uh it's a three-man operation it's a small so, automotive shop three-man operation where are you operate out of uh southeast portland right at 122nd foster it's affordable car doctor 15 years in business you know um and it it's i've kept it small so i could travel and build be a champion i have a great team of three that runs the shop when i'm on the road Oh, that's nice. When you can have people like that, you can, you can yeah. count on and do things, but yeah. you brought up something and I got some, I got some things in the background. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My guy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah Seiko, I Gus Seiko. They're my guys, Charlie Agazino defense. Yeah. So listen, my kids yeah. use this every night. There's the foaming hand wash. Yeah. Ham and yeah. Yeah. wash. This is a uh, oatmeal. Um, I yeah. see you got some antifungal and some acne bars back there. You got it all. You got the travel kit, but, what has it been like working with Guy Seiko? And ironically yeah. enough, he's the one who turned me on to you. He handed me a copy of your book one day. Oh, yeah. Here, check this out. This guy, I like this guy. Ironically enough, he's ex-law enforcement, Cleveland PD for 25 yeah. years. And <laughs> yeah. Dealing with a guy who was in the depths. He was, he'd have been busting you 30 years ago. Right. Right? right. It's, How yeah, wild yeah. is the full circle of all this? Hey, hey, it's, it's us and them. For, for 20 years, you know, I, cops and robbers, like, and then to come back around, you know, and, and, and it's, it, it, you know, it's really healing, you know, and it's good to know that, you know, that we can change and that we can heal and that we can work together. Like we're both, you know, we're trying to work towards the same common goal at the end of the day it's today, you know, <laughs> but uh, that's one of the, you know, that's one of the beauties of, of, of finding yourself and changing your life and doing something positive and impacting people is that, you know, guys like us can, can have a relationship. 
we can get along and we can help other people together, you know? Um, but when I came around, like you got, and this is unique too. I'm an ex convict. I'm a, I'm a felon. Like why, why would a national, but why would they even want to be part of me? You know, why would Adidas wrestling want to be part of this thing? Well, it's because of what we've done the last 20 years, you know? Um, and we're out changing people's lives for the positive. And I'm not a facade. I'm not a, this is not, you know, this is not, this is real. You know, I'm out here really living a life of recovery and really teaching people about, you know, the dangers of this stuff. Um, Guy Seiko has been awesome, man. I could not be more happy to have him partner with him and, and, and inspire me to want to do more. And uh, that guy is golden, dude. Um, but I love the cops today. You got to remember, like, I love the cops. You know, they're out there risking their lives to chase the worst of the worst, man. And uh, I had no idea that I would have the respect I have for law enforcement today, you know, 20 years ago. You know, they were my worst enemy. It's wild to think about it. I mean, how just like we, we keep saying full circle, it's come for you. But uh, Portland, right? Portland's a different place. There's a lot going on in Portland. Uh, How do you view it from you're an ex, you were in a homeless shelter, an addict. How do you view the current revolution of what's going on in Portland with the massive amount of homelessness that's in there, drug addiction that's in there? Right. Like how, what is your viewpoint now that you, you have a home, you have a business, you have a job, you, you've made things right with your family. You're no longer addicted. Right. What is your viewpoint of the massive amount of homelessness and drug addiction in Portland, Oregon? Oh, it's, it's, it's abundant. It's out of control. And that's why this hope tour is so important to us right now. My family be a champion. And, uh, we're going on the road for a whole year. We, we're renting out our house. We're right now, dude. I still have this little office, but right now we're emptying our house. We're starting over. So we want, wait, we want, wait, are you mar well, you're married now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How long have you yeah, been married over, now? Oh, 12 years. Yeah. 12 years. Yeah. You don't have oh, any children together, right? No, no. We decided not to. We're a okay. little late in the game. But okay. I, oh, yeah, I have a 40 pound beagle. Yeah, yeah. So, you have a 40 pound beagle? Is that what you said? <laughs> I'm a big beagle. <laughs> so, so you and your wife are going to go on tour. She's going to come on tour with you. Yep. And you guys are just going to go out. We're, you own your house in Portland and you're going to, yep. are you going to like Airbnb it? Or are you going to just rent it out? We're actually tr trying to rent it out fully furnished. We're retiring all our stuff. We're boxing a few things up. We're going on the road, man. And, and, and if, if, the world needs us out there right now more than ever before. And so uh, we're going to hit the road. We're going for the whole school year. We're, we got a little 17-foot uh, uh, trailer that we wrapped in Be a Champion. That's what we're taking across the country. And uh, we're going to go live in a trailer for the next year or two and hopefully bring our program to every school across the country. You know? How do we get you? How does someone get yeah. you if they want <laughs> to come speak? How do we get you? Well, you go to – First, you do, you're the voice. You go back to your school, you share my website with them, and there's a lot of content on there, Jeff. There's a lot of content of our story, our program, our audible, what we do, the national tour videos on there. It's beachampionlife.com. And uh, you just reach out to us, man. We have a couple of programs we're going to, there's a gold program and a platinum program, Jeff. And both programs, um, we, uh, uh, the, the platinum program, we come in for an assembly or two depending on how big your school is we have smaller focus groups in the afternoon in classrooms we go to a home event home game that you have introduce us we have a book signing um it's all day man i go to wrestling practice during wrestling season meet your athletes and run a clinic talk to the kids and and uh you know it's all day Zeb. and then we have a platinum program where we just do um an assembly or two at the school depending on what the, what the school wants us to do, you know, but I, I could have been a 40 minute podium assembly speaker. That's what most of them do. Zeb. Like, God damn, you're going to fly me across the country for 40 minutes. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to spend the day with your kids, man, because I know we're reaching them from different angles throughout the day. I eat lunch in the cafeteria. I'm touchable. I'm tangible. I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm next to these kids, you know? 
And, um, you know, we play the ESPN documentary and I, I share my, my story of struggle to success. And, and the kids need to hear it because they can all, they've seen it in their lives. They can all relate to it. And, uh, but yeah, we're going to be in Ohio. Don't, I'm going to be in the first of September. I'm going to be there for three weeks in Ohio. Where are you all going to go? Uh, well, I don't have that completely mapped out yet, but we're going to be in Ohio. We're going to be in Vermilion. We're going to be in Cleveland couple other suburban smaller towns within a couple hours of that area um, we know that so far but a lot of schools don't schedule us until august september when school starts you know gotcha. so it's going to grow back? life of its own once we we're go we're leaving the mid of august so the first two three weeks we're traveling and just enjoying ourselves and getting to ohio that's where the tour starts is in ohio okay. and then we work our way up to new york down to new york North Carolina, Florida, and over to Texas. And it's going to start in Ohio, 1st of September. Did you going to put 10,000 miles on your vehicle easy? 20,000, actually, is what Holy we predict. 20,000, yeah. What do you got? It's you a, got a Tacoma? What do you got? I got a Dodge Ram. I got a Dodge Ram, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're taking a pretty big risk, Zeb, but we're pretty sure that we're going to be able to blow this thing up and, and touch a lot of lives throughout the process. Rich, what would you say um, – you know, to someone who's trying to find Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, what would you say to them? And what would be your, your big, biggest advice to somebody who's trying to get out of the hole, who's trying to find help? What would you say? What would you say to someone who's addicted right now? Well, I, you know, I tell them they got to find, they got to find other recovering addicts that can relate to what they're going through. You know, you, some of them, you got to get real. Well, the, the, the hit, some people don't want to go to treatment for six months, Seth. They don't want to give up that much time to save their life, you know, and if you can, you know, you, but, but what I found is that 30 days isn't enough for a guy like me. 60 days wasn't enough for a guy like me. It had to be good six months, you know, but. You were in rehab would, for six months? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where did you three go? Months, three months and then three months and then three months of an aftercare of sober, sober living, you know. Wow. Six where, months. Where at? Uh, Central City Concern right here in Portland. So yeah. in Port you, you stayed in Portland I, and did it. I did. I did. Wow. And some people try to relocate and all that, you know, but I went right back in the fires. Zeb. I said, I, I was, I was done. Zeb. Zeb, I was done. You know, I had been beaten down. I was done. I submitted. I was willing to do whatever it took, you know, and, and, and I went through that process. You know, I went to a meeting every day for two years. Wow. You know, so you do you be, still attend? Do you still attend now? Yeah, even today with uh, 18, almost 19 years sober, I, I attend a handful per year is, is where, what I do. I do a handful per year. So once a know. month, basically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If that even, you know. But uh, I think part of it was I insulated myself from that lifestyle by being accountable to all these kids I speak to about my you, – you, you know, Frank Papalizio out of Journeyman Wrestling – 20 years ago, he brought me into his club to talk to some kids. And uh, I actually I wrote about that story in my book. Uh, and the first time I ever spoke was in New York. And uh, he brought me in. I talked to his kids. And, and then we went out for dinner. And one of the things he, he asked me was, he goes, are you going to be like a lot of the other addicts with that revolving door? Are you going to be that one that talks to all these kids and instills positive values? And then two years later, we're going to find out you're – you know, you're back down that road, you know, and uh, what I found is the more kids I talked to, uh, the more I wanted to make sure that I made it, you know, because every one of those kids, I want them to look me up in three, five years, 20 years later and see that I'm still living that positive life. Somebody. I got, a, I got, a, I, in fact, I just got a, got an email from a gal. Here's a great story, dude. And I don't know how many people have been affected, Zeb. I have no clue, right? Like I just been traveling all around the country for years and my story has been on links and ESPN and, you know, it's moved around a lot, you know? Um, and so I don't know the, the full scope of the impact of the comeback story, you know, but I got a letter recently and that's what reminded me of why I'm doing it. It reminded me of, of one of the things that helped keep me inspired to keep moving is uh, I got an email from a gal. She said, Hey, um, is this, be a champion in life, you know. My boyfriend uh, was at a seminar of yours back in 2008 and nine in middle school, something like that. And she said that he has worn 
one of my be a champion wristbands that i give to the kids at the seminars for 15 years dude it's or whatever it was 12 it was he's a grown he's a young man he's got a kid he's got he'd been wearing it till it broke off right and she said it was his most i got chills dude just talking about this um like you know it's just a reminder that it may not be what I said, but it's that one little thing that you do say that you do that could really change somebody's life, you know. Um, but that wristband had finally broken. And she was asking if I could get her another wristband for her boyfriend because it was his prized possession. He never took it off, you know. And, uh, you know, I'm in tears. I got chills. I'm a oh, wristband, you know, the, the magnitude of that wristband, right, and, and what it did. So of course I emailed back what's your address and and I put a big old gift box together, you know, they, you know, bunch of wristbands and books and, and sweatshirts and stuff. And I can't imagine just that girl reaching out to me and what it did for her boyfriend, you know, moving forward, you know. So I had someone say to me who was an alcoholic, I was like, well, Do you drink anymore? Can can you drink anymore? And their reply to me was, once you're a pickle, you'll never be a cucumber again. Is that true? <laughs> yeah. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. Hey, a lot of people say, hey, well, you've been clean. you've been sober a long time. You, you mean you don't you, – can you sit down and have a drink now, right? You want to go out for a drink? You know, it's like, can you, can't you? The question, you know, I have no idea. I just know for sure that if I did, the liability is massive, you know? Yeah. So – so, I mean, that's all. It's just like, maybe I could, but the liability, if I can't have, I'm not going to find out. I, I'm not going to find out. My life's way too good to jeopardize it. Do you think um, the city of Portland has confused compassion with what they think is the right thing? Do you think that they think they're being compassionate, but they're actually giving people a blank check and they're destroying other people's lives? Do you think that that's a little bit of the problem in Portland, Oregon? They're creating a much bigger struggle. Yes, much bigger. They struggle. They think they're being compassionate. Because, yeah, yeah. They're creating yeah, like, a I'm monster. Help these guys. I'm going to help yeah. these monsters, but they're actually creating more monsters, a bigger monster. You know, they're co-signing. They're co-signing. You yeah. know, yeah. Uh, they're co. They're saying, "Hey, it's okay. Here, here. Here's a little more for you." You know, they wanted to give out these little kids. I mean, are you, I just it's mind blowing. Wait, the the the, the the it's, clean it? injectable but, kits, right? The, the kit. Kid, right? Yeah, with that's got a pipe. It's got a. I call my wife and I go, "They got a kid." Are you kidding me? Oh, they, they mailed some of those out, I believe. Yeah, I believe some of those yeah, got mailed out. They don't want the glass to hurt. Are you? I'm. 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 Here I am. I'm battling. I'm. I'm. I'm at the other end of the spectrum, and this is happening. This is really happening. Like I'm. I'm over here trying to. I, I don't get it, dude. But well, Rich, it's I just, want you to think about it. Let's have some empathy here. Let's have some. Empathy. Yeah. 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 Right. You're right. that monster. And they give you, right? You know, and, and and I don't know if you, I don't know what the extent of your drug abuse was, but you know, when people start getting to, the, they start injecting, that's the whole next level, right? Because then you've got a whole another different blood bloodborne pathogen diseases. You've got all these different things that are that come along with injecting because nobody's they're not. Well, let's make sure that that needle's clean. No, you're an addiction. You're so high, you don't know what way's up, left, right, down. You don't know. You'll use whatever someone gives you to stick in your veins. So, so I don't know. A, I don't know. I'm asking get, you. I'm asking you. Get, what do you think? Let's, let's give them a kit, Zeb. Let's not give them a pathway to sobriety. Let's give them a kit. And, and we, can, we can actually – I'm not going to dissect this too much because right now their treatment has changed in 20 years since I was in treatment, okay? We actually literally did get sober and stayed sober. That's what we did. That was treatment. That was recovery. And now they have Suboxone and, you know, the, these, these pills and things that are part of the treatment system now, you know. So it was a different mindset 20 years ago. And now treatment has changed a little bit, too, even today. You know? Yeah. Um, so I was watching but, a Brett Favre interview the other day. And yeah. he talked about he was taking 15 uh, Percocets, Vicodins, whatever it was, pain pills a day. Right. Yeah. Well, they prescribed him 30 at a time when he was uh, going through it. And he'd be going guy to guy to guy in the locker room, you know, hey, can I get, can I get, you know, this? And, and you're on 15. I mean, 
You're doing some major damage, obviously, to your kidney, your liver, your stomach, all everything, yeah. right? Yeah. He says he's he said by the time he's circling back around the locker room, it was a lot quicker than he remembered it before. But here's the big thing he said that kind of really got me. Everybody else knew he was the last one that knew he they had know. a problem. <laughs> yeah. Is that yeah. right? Is that yeah. did were you yeah. the last one to know? Absolutely. Everybody else do. It's denial. It's not rec- It's not looking in the mirror. You know, it's not understanding like all your loved ones, everybody around you that cares knows that you're, you're messed up. You know, um, we are the last one. I was the last one to know, you know, and you know, if you're, if you're, and, and, and the thing is the hard part as a loved one, as a parent, as a, is, is to set boundaries that need to be set make people look at that's the hardest part is cutting off that cutting off that cord you know um and once you can actually do that you're starting to reach the attic a little bit you know um and that's probably the hardest part of all but you know one of the things that that i want to talk about is wrestling from so one of the things i talk about is finding the wrestling in your life Zeb. it's not just about getting sober getting off drugs it's about finding that thing that helps keep you positively motivated your passion you know your love for something and for me it was wrestling um but for other people to find that wrestling in their life is what helps you stay on track you know i had to fill that hole i had to fill that void i had to fill that that thing that drugs filled you know and uh, and it was wrestling coaching now it's seminars and helping kids and and being a part of the solution Zeb, you know whether it's we're getting people. ready. I'm leaving for Utah tomorrow too. I'm I love I'm it. on the road two weeks, dude. You're getting it. So so you're saying someone could be an artist. Well, immerse yourself yeah. self in your art. You might be a runner. Immerse yourself in running. If you like to walk and hike, immerse yourself in white uh, hiking and walking. Find something. Find your wrestling. Find your your purpose to stay clean. Obviously, your family should be your purpose to stay clean. But not everybody finds that, and they have to. They have to throw themselves into something else in order to, because it, it's a monster. Like we talked about, there's no, no regular dopamine spikes in nature that can compensate for what crystal meth does in yep. the human brain, the brain, brain chemistry. I just, I don't think a lot of people get that because like you said, on the back side of it and the gray, the low is so, so low, even compared Brilliant. to that massive high. And that's like what, what I read in the Oregonian, and their biggest thing when they did, they talked about the faces of mess stuff and then frontline did a special on it. And, and I watched that and then I read and it, the, the math thing was just, and then the Median cartel cartel really got into producing a much more pure crystal math after you, you, you didn't get the super pure math. You were off of it by then you were on the backside yeah. of addiction and you were locked up or whatever. And you, you luckily didn't get that super pure math and oh three oh four oh five oh six you know yeah. you were on the road to recovery yeah. and i mean that's a monster and i don't think a lot you of get, people understand what it does to the body too your yeah and level. you got it yeah it, it destroys stuff and, and i and I've, I've got some 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 things i kind of deal with you know i have some little glitches and things but for the most part i've been pretty damn healthy i was really lucky you know that's amazing um i i really was and then i think that like i said i test i put a lot of weight in that 10 years of competition because the lifestyle that I was living um, really helped in a lot of ways. Um, but you have to take that obsession to use and shift it over here. And it's okay to obsess about wrestling. It's okay to obsess about coaching. It's okay to obsess about your family. Something else has to, you know, and I found a pretty good high in competition. Like it's pretty intense to be a wrestler, you know? So I was able to, to find a pretty good driving force through the sport, you know? And, uh, uh, and I think it really helped fill that hole inside of me, you know, being that athlete again, you know, and then even to, even today. Okay. So the other thing, um, you're able to do all this because you own a business, you own a small business, right? Like what, first of what degree do you get an associate's degree from Clackamas? I did. I went in the automotive industry. I was just going to say, was it automotive? And is, does it deal directly with so, your business? I don't know that. I'm asking. Uh, yeah, right, right. Uh, yes, it does. So I had to take a look at my life. I was 34 years old getting sober. I'm 37, 38, going back to college. I got two kids that are uh, – so I've 
got to figure out I, I'm, I'm not young anymore. I'm not young anymore. So I had to stop and figure out what was the one thing that I could, I could study that I was passionate about that I loved. Well, I loved wrestling and I loved cars. I had been working on cars since I was a little kid. So I said, you know what? I'm going to couple them together and I'm going to make a run at these two. These were the two main things. And so I got an education, got a degree, got automotive certificates. I did really well. And uh, I had a lot of background in automotive. So, uh, so, you know, I started a little shop, a little, little couple car shop, you know, and it's grown into, you know, yeah, what it is today. You know, I slowly, just slowly started running a business. <laughs> Listen, the guys that I meet and know from Oregon and Washington, you know, Pacific Northwest, Idaho, uh, they're different people, all of them. From Kevin Roberts, he's from <laughs> yeah. Spokane. Yep. He's a maniac. Um, yep. Linlin, Linlin's yep. from, from Oregon. Um, I'll, I'll see him Joe tomorrow. Joe Russell, <laughs> Joe Russell's from uh, yep. Gresham, I think. I believe yep. it's Joe, yep. Joe's from Gresham, isn't he? Yeah. Joe. Joe and Dan are both from Gresham. Yep. Yeah. And then um yeah. who's the other one who's a complete maniac? And I'm like, these people are just nuts. They're nuts. And it's just, <laughs> yeah. it's just such a different place, man. I love it. Oh, Chael Chael yeah. Sonnen is from uh Chael what, Sonnen, yeah. West Lynn. I mean, just different guys. But you guys streets. all everybody I talk, every name I just mentioned finds another thing to do in their life on top of like I'm not just going to be a teacher. I'm not just going to yeah. be a coach. I'm not just going to be a small business owner. I'm going to yeah, do yeah, this. Yeah. I'm going to do that. They all have something else that they do. They've all, everybody I just named has a side hustle yep. of some type. They got has a, a great side hustle. On. They're yep. always something, yep. something else going on in their lives. And I, once again, I don't know if I'm stereotyping that area and the yeah, type of yeah, people yeah. you guys are, but yeah. you're just real different people out in the Pacific Northwest. And I love it. That's why I love it. So I'm coming back out. Love the place. Just, We're going to pass, though. We're going to pass. I like, You're going to be coming to Ohio. Yep, being yep. You're going to be um, – I like to talk uh, – so what I like to talk – so I just did this little talk about – about I'm talking about successful people, you know, and we're trying to figure out is it their looks, is it their IQ, is it their education, is it their, their ability, what is it that successful people have in common? And we're not talking about success meaning a dollar amount. It means success, right? And I look at – like I'm a successful person, you know, um, and you look at from where I was to where I'm at now and there's different variables, but what it is, is it's grit. It's grit, Zeb. Having grit, that's the key element. Having grit, willing to bear down, willing to keep fighting, willing to keep moving, raise the bar, reach your goal, raise it up again, and just keep going no matter how hard it gets. And being resilient, it's grit, dude. That's what all the successful people seem to have in common is grit, dude. That's the word for today. <laughs> Listen, the MLK quote, if you can't fly, run. If you can't run, <laughs> walk. If you can't <laughs> walk, <laughs> crawl. But crawl. by all means, <laughs> yeah. keep moving. And that's what, like, a lot of those guys, they're gritty, yep. they're tough, they're just – they're yeah. resilient. And I think that – like you're saying, like last night, um, I took my kid to wrestling camp with Johnny DeJulius up at Kenston High School. And um, Johnny plays this game called Johnny Ball. And it's like you can only – you're fighting over a ball and you got to drag the ball back to your wall and touch the wall, right? And it's a fight. It's a fight. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's a yeah. fight. So my kid and um, this other kid, Walker – Walker's a tough little kid. They get in this fight, and then Johnny calls the other two. There's two more groups, my other little kids in the other group, and they jump on there, and they're beating each other up. They're fighting for this ball. They're fighting for this ball. They're fighting for this ball. Walker gets so exhausted. He fights my son so hard, and they fight for this ball, and they just fight, and they fight, and they fight. Eventually, my kid gets the ball to the wall, but, like, I think that Walker could probably beat my kid up in wrestling, which he should. <laughs> but, like – I think that that's a, that's where just, you get it. It's just, just grit. I'll quit. show you the video. Just, yeah, just, yeah. They fought. We just put them yeah. in there and they fought. They weren't punching. They weren't elbowing. They were right, kicking. Right. It was just fighting and gripping yep. and ripping and just doing what you can to get to the wall. And yeah, I like that. And I think that's what the sport of wrestling really teaches you. I think to, to your point of well, how it saved you and brought you back into the fold and gave you something positive to be fixated on besides drugs and alcohol, I think that that's ultimately the message you're trying to get across. It really, it really is. And, and a lot of, you know, and a, a lot of people don't real like, 
like the truth is, is to go from there to get here, there was a lot of obstacles, man. There was a lot of things pushing back at me, you know, and it would have been easy to fold, easy to quit, easy to throw in the towel over and over and over and all these different scenarios in life because of my past. And, um, and I was, I've been able to just keep moving. And that's really what you're, what you're saying is what I did. If I can't push this wall, I'm going to go around that wall. If I can't run, I'm going to walk. And that really is a lot to do with it. Okay. There's a few other ways I can go about this, you know, cause I got my, my seven felonies multi-state all expunged set now, you know, um, really I had, uh, you, you, yeah, yeah. So, so right now, so yeah. does a background check it doesn't it's, show any felonies on you. It's going to come back clear, you know, no and way. I don't quite have my gun rights back yet, but I got, I'm clear. And, and, and I thought that would never happen. You I know? think you and, can get them back in and, Ohio. A judge can reinstate your second amendment yeah, rights here in Ohio. I'm, I know that. I'm working towards next steps, you know, because you want to hunt. Don't you? you want to hunt. I'm, I'm, I'm moving. I'm on the hunt, dude. I love you know, it. so, so, uh, and, and this is a massive accomplishment. Like maybe I'm not looking for a job or an apartment, and all these things, but it's like, Hey, I messed that up. I want to fix it. I want to fix it. I want to, I want to let people know that you can, you know, um, and then going out for the college team and, you know, not having a driver's license for 20 years, all these things, dude, you know, that they are standing in your way and you just keep moving and you just keep chipping away at it, Zeb, chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. And pretty soon you start, you know, realizing like there's nothing holding us back. You can dream as big as you want. You can keep going. You can do that. Set the bar high. Set it. Don't. Don't shortchange your set it way up there and go get it, you know, but you got to be willing to stay focused and stay on track. That's one of the things that I have. I'm, I'm not easily distracted from the primary goal. You know, I, I stay, I'm pretty, pretty focused on some things and uh, I'm able to, to just keep moving towards them. And I think that's a, a huge attribute to being able to, to get where we're at and then grit, grit, being gritty, man um and uh and resilient and shake it off and keep going you know okay so you're the subject of an emmy award-winning short film right documentary yeah how much for, did you get an award by the way did you yes. get one did they, so, do you yeah. have an emmy <laughs> do you have an emmy so this i always forget that some of these are just audio right so yeah i got the emmy sitting right behind my head here you have an you emmy it's, but the, but it's all it's sitting right here behind my head and there's a stop sign sitting there, and I got the ring on. You know, I'm all set up here. Do you really have an Emmy? Can you show me yeah. an Emmy? Produce yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I want to – It's yeah. like I, I listen, yeah. you yeah. I want to take yeah. a screenshot of it before we get off here because that fire, yeah. you have an Emmy award. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How much so, – but- well, Go ahead. Go how ahead, much Jeff. video – how much – how many days did they stay with you and shoot you? Okay, so that's – Okay, so the day before the national tournament, I'm in front of the camera six or seven hours dredging oh. up my story, dude, before the national tournament. And I, if I would have realized how exhausting that was going to be and how important the next day, I might have I might have tried to navigate it differently, you know. But not that that's, you know, it's just um, – it, it was a grind, dude. And then they spent the, a few days with me and Clackamas, and it was a few days. Dude, we spent it was probably days. a week of shooting. Yeah, yeah, putting the put shooting in, and then they wow. and then they came out with this great life changing video. It's really good out there, dude. It's I really still good. use it. To, I use it in my seminars still. It's I use really it, good. You know, um, that sets a good tone, tells a good part of the story, and then I take over. You know, um, but we got to remember now. Here, here's my chime. I was just talking to a, a an athlete yesterday. I'm leaving for Utah tomorrow. We're packing the trailer right now as we speak. I got Robert Plimpton, man. I'm surprised no D1 co- coaches grabbed him yet, but we're still working on it. But he is has won just about everything, and he's a good kid. We're going on the road tomorrow um, for five days of competition in Utah. So pretty pretty pumped about that. Um, oh, but I was talking to him about we got the stop sign finally. We got the Emmy. You know, all, all these these cool, awesome accomplishments. They're all shiny and everything, but – you know, what it really came down to is I was chasing a national title for 10 years. And what I found is that the, the real gold medal was becoming that father I wanted to become. 
becoming that husband I wanted to become, becoming that man of integrity in the process. And that really, I didn't realize it till later. We chant about it and talk about it. Well, I lived it in my life. Now I can step back and go, that's what was really important, you know. But it's still cool. <laughs> I got listen. It's I got to cool. see it. I don't know any any other <laughs> Emmy Award winners. So, <laughs> well, they fired up. I'll have it on the. Hey, hang on. I'll have it in Cleveland in in a couple months. You can take a picture with it yourself. I believe. <laughs> wow. Well, you're the subject of it. I mean, they don't have they don't win the Emmy yeah. without you. Right. So, so, uh, so no, I didn't go to the showing and get it presented to me on a stage. And, but the story impacted so many people that the producers wanted to send me a gift. Right. And, and I'm still friends with him today. I'm going to see him in Florida. When I go to Florida on this trip, Martin Kotobashi, he called me up one day. He goes, Hey, I got a gift coming your way. Be ready. It'll be there in a couple of days. Right. So the UPS driver comes to my shop. And he says, he sets this thing on my, I don't know what it is. I know that they're sending me something. Yeah, it's a sweatshirt, a t-shirt, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. who knows? You know, I mean, and I was like, oh yeah. And he goes, it's from ESPN and the USP, the, you know, the UPS driver says, I've been driving for 25 years. He says, I've never seen a package from ESPN. Can I be here when you open it? <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> so I cut this thing open and. There's a, it's, it's styrofoam. I pull the lid off and it's like, oh, there's this beautiful gold Emmy sitting there. And the guy looks at me like, what? And I'm, and I'm in tears, you know, it, it, it was crazy, dude. And uh, what a, what a amazing gift, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, and I, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that one, uh, that's the one that stands out on the trophy shelf. <laughs> like you said, though, it's not really about the trophy. It's about the experience to get to the trophy, right? It's about the journey. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, it's the, it's the life changing experience along the, it, it, it's everything leading up to that moment. You're at the top of that podium. It's everything else that's really important in life. That's all that really matters. You know, it affects me. It affects my family. It affects the people around me in a positive way that I'm doing the right thing every day, you know, that they can look at me and go, that guy's doing the right thing. You know, he's living a positive life, you know, and that's what brings guys like Guy into my life. That's what brings like guys like Tom Scully from Adidas into my life. You know, it's unheard of to be sponsored by these guys from my background. You know, it's about who we represent today and together we can impact more people and more kids as a, as a good team, you know, I can do more with partnering with the right partners than I can myself, you know? And, um, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. We got the Emmy. We're going to travel. With Let's it. see worry, the stop sign and yeah. the Emmy. If you can show those to me, go ahead. Right now. Are you on the, yeah, we're, we're good. Yeah. Show me. I want to see it. Oh, you can't, you can't see the. Uh... There it is. <laughs> Put in the seat. Put in the shot. Back up. Oh, back up a little bit. Back up a little. Bit. Take screenshots of it. One more. Go I'll back. Back, you. back. Go back so I can see the whole statue. Dude, that's sick. Oh, oh, you oh, oh, you're, okay. Oh, oh. <laughs> you're okay. I got it. I got it. And then you got I'll your stop See, I couldn't see that in my view. That yeah. wasn't in my view. I couldn't oh. see it. Right, you lost, well, I lost you again. Oh, I see. You can't see it in your, your yeah, screenshot. I couldn't see it. Oh, there, right, there hey. it is. There, there it is. Oh, right there. I got it. Yeah, yeah. There we go. go. We there got it, go. man. We're knocking everything so, over. So what you got, you got all my, you got the poster there with some of the sponsors that help fuel the bus in the fall, you know, and they back up our brand and we partner and, and you know, we're having, we got a clinic coming up here in a, in a month too. We got Chance Marsteller coming to Oregon. He can have Seth Seth Gross coming they to Oregon. They can both wrestle. They can both wrestle. Uh, yeah. They can both wrestle. They can, they're grinders. They're yeah, yeah, they're okay. They're, they're okay. So hey, Chance, Chance has got a great story. He's got oh, a great story of, of, of redemption. Redemption. Why do you think I brought him in? Yeah. Why do you yeah, think that's I a great him, story. You know? That's a great yes. story. Yeah, but, so I'm looking forward to that. I love it. Okay, Richard, so give me any dates or information that you can so people can find you because we're about to be done here. Yeah. We're past oh, our man. hour. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So uh, anyway, so if you go to Be a Champion Life on all social media platforms, 
BeAChampionLife.com, you'll find a lot more information about our national tour, our autobiography, our story. If you heard something today that you want to find out more about, just go to our website, you know, and uh, we are leaving Oregon mid-August. We're on the road. We're going to go enjoy ourselves and, and tour around the country for two or three weeks, and we're going to land in Ohio. That first week of September, that's when the tour begins is in Ohio. We have schools in Ohio, North Carolina, New York, Florida, and Texas so far. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure we hit every state if we can, you know. So we're going to be in Ohio. We're going to be all over the East Coast. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea is to see if we can pull some more schools in. Because today, this message is really important, you know. We got some issues going on. And these kids need to hear about my story. Definitely. Richard Jensen, be a champion in life. The Hope Tour is coming up, starting in Ohio in August 2022. Stick around for a little bit. Check out www.barbarianapparel.com. Richard, thanks for the time. Thank you, Zeb.